So today's session is on intelligent procurement using AI to drive savings and efficiency. And we're really lucky enough to be joined um, by um, Amazon Business for, for this session. And thank you for their continued support with SIT. It's fabulous to have them here with us today. And they've brought along a case study as well. So not only will we be cutting through some jargon and busting a few myths, but we've got some real life application of, of the, um, the technology to hopefully inspire you all to go away and look at where you can implement it in your organizations. So without further ado, um, I'm going to invite Molly to join me, Molly Dobson, who's Country Manager at Amazon Business for UK and Ireland. Hi, Molly. Hi, Emma. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me join you today. Yeah, great to see you. It's such a, an interesting topic. I mean, it's something that uh, we're, we're, lots of people are talking about. It seems a bit of a buzz. So we're, we'll get to that in, in a bit about kind of busting some of those myths and, and cutting through the jargon. But um, tell me a little bit about, about you and your role at Amazon Business. Sure. Um, so my name is Molly Dobson. I am the country manager for Amazon Business UK and Ireland. Um, I've been with Amazon for just about seven years now and Amazon Business for the past three. Uh, so I've worked on both the supply side and the demand side of Amazon. Um, so I spent a lot of time out in the field talking to customers, vendors, sellers. And in my time with Amazon and Amazon Business, I've picked up on a lot of key themes that I hear from business leaders around the world. And it typically comes down to the notion that business leaders are regularly asked to do more with the same or probably do more with less. Mm -hmm. And I think the last year and a half has really brought that concept to the, to the forefront even more, where the demands on procurement leaders, finance leaders, buyers in general, P&L owners, the demands are higher than ever. And I, I think if you need to be in an environment where you need to navigate coming out of the pandemic to find this new way of the future, people really are starting to think differently about how they run their organizations, the tools they use, the resources they have, things of that sort. So what I want to do today, um, bringing it back to Amazon Business, we, we are a B2B marketplace, and I'll spend a little bit time at the end talking about Amazon Business specifically. Um, but I, I want to talk more broadly about finding efficiencies, um, driving intelligent procurement, because there is a lot to learn, I think, from you all talking to each other, and hopefully me bringing some of the, the customer insights to the table. And then Keely and Harry, of course, um, tell you their story in a bit. So um, again, want to talk more broadly about intelligent procurement and tools and resources and things of like that, but then we'll bring it into a more practical space to talk about Amazon business a little bit later. Excellent. Thanks for that. And like I said, AI has been a bit of a buzzword that's been around for some time now. Um, and some of us are still grappling with, with what it is and exactly how to um, implement it in our business. Do you think we need to demystify exactly what it is and, and how it can be used? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, digital solutions in general or digital transformation initiatives, it's been critical for helping everyone respond to the pandemic in the last year. And, and there's a slide that we put together that I think kind of simplifies and distills the notion of AI, ML buzzwords and bring, brings it into something that's a little more tangible. So um, the slide that Emma uh, showed on the screen for you, it's something that we use to talk to customers about AI and ML. So think of it like these in embedded circles that you see, and then the doing to thinking um, band on the left-hand side. So automation is the overarching, all-encompassing concept that we talk about that all of these other terms sit within. So automation in this case, we're really just talking about um, the removal of human intervention, reducing the need for humans to intervene in processes. So this is just automation in general. Within automation, you've got artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence really in its core is just the use of technology to simulate human behaviors and thought processes. So digital technology, it's everywhere. It is absolute key to what we're talking about here with automation being the removal or reduction of human intervention and artificial intelligence using technology to simulate intelligence and thought processes. So it's intelligence demonstrated by machines as opposed to the natural intelligence that is displayed in most humans, let's say. Within artificial intelligence, you've got the engine behind it. So what powers artificial intelligence or AI? It's machine learning. So machine learning you can see sitting within artificial intelligence there, machine learning, a subset of artificial intelligence. And that really is the use of systems here, systems that are able to learn and adapt 
without requiring explicit instructions from um, a human or from uh, inputs from a human and that can draw inferences from data. So mm -hmm. here we are, we're talking about technology that simulates human behavior and thought process with AI. Within that machine learning, it's the power behind it. It's the systems themselves that are the ones that are learning and adapting and learning how to draw inferences from data without you having to tell it what to do. Then at the core of that, you've got, you've got the brain. This is where the real thinking happens. And a term that we use for that or that is generally used for that deep thinking is deep learning here. So deep learning at the core of this graphic, it's a type of machine learning and it's based on this concept of artificial neural networks. Bear with me on this. So these <laughs> artificial, yeah, artificial neural networks, they imitate the way that humans gain certain types of knowledge. So this is where it gets really interesting because we, we've created artificial intelligence, the technology, the machine learning systems to simulate that artificial intelligence. But deep learning is when the systems and machines can really start doing some of that thinking without your intervention at all. So think about things like uh, computer vision or speech recognition. Now that's a fun one that we'll talk about later. Speech recognition, technology and software and tools, it learns from the inputs that it gets and it, it creates its own knowledge and its own learning off the back of that. So it's a really interesting um, spectrum that you can see here, starting with automation and seeing how all the different pieces fit together. And it really follows along this line of thinking and doing. So automation is the, the doing. It's the output of all of these um, elements within. It's when I can click a button and something happens and I don't have to do it. That's the doing. The thinking part is really what comes down to the core of deep learning. And that's where the systems start being a little more intelligent um, than they were before and they learn from themselves. So I, I like this as a visual to kind of show how all the pieces fit together and how the words aren't exactly interchangeable, even though some people use them that way, but they are heavily related. And I think in general, procurement is a very data rich um, part of the organization. Oftentimes though, you can be data rich and insight poor. And the data within procurement can be very structured, like the stuff that comes from tables and databases and things of that sort, or it could be completely unstructured. So streams of real-time data on order information or customer feedback on a website. So I think procurement is really an area that is ripe for use of artificial intelligence because it is so heavily reliant on that data. But this is just kind of a visual that I think is helpful for me understanding how they all fit together. And then I think is good for breaking down those buzzwords a little bit. Absolutely. That's made it a lot clearer. And um, you're absolutely spot on with that data. I mean, loads of CPOs that we've spoken to, particularly over the last 12 to 18 months, you know, they've been called into more board meetings than ever asking for the, the data, the, you know, reporting, etc. So I can see where, where this really fits in. So what does that look like in reality, though? How do these tools really come to life? There's a lot of different ways. So there's another graphic that um, we like to share. If you want to put up the side that we put together, I like this graphic as well. Um, so again, it, it touches on all of these different elements in an organization and in organizational processes where AI and ML can really help. And some of them you you know of without actually being aware of the, the artificial intelligence behind it. But picking off on a couple of these, on the far left, you've got merchandising, for example. Intelligent merchandising. Mm -hmm. This is where your, your solution can identify based on how you've shopped in the past, based on buttons you've clicked, things you've searched for, you can real-time display content that is relevant to the, the customer profile and to what you think they'll buy and their circumstances. So it could be seasonal related products, or for example, I got a puppy a few months ago, lockdown stereotype. I will buy anything for my dog. And I just happened to be shopping for little faux leather miniature sofas for a dog the other day. Don't judge. <laughs> Yesterday, I checked my email and I've got, I've got a message from that provider that said, um, what do you know? We've got 10% off pet accessories uh, today. And I click on the website and I see pet accessories everywhere. So I know that I walked into that one, but that's the kind of intelligent merchandising where you can display what is most relevant to your customer to get them to interact with it. Same thing with um, circles up there, you see like product recommendations. Because I've demonstrated certain behaviors, the solution will tell me what it thinks I am most likely to want or what I am most likely to buy and give recommendations to me, maybe even because other customers that have demonstrated similar behaviors 
then went on to buy a certain type of product. So there's a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning power behind recommendations. Same thing that you'll see with customer service. This is another big one. Um, my energy provider spent a lot of time on their WhatsApp customer service this week asking questions about my meter reading. And it always starts with a chat bot that asks me basic questions. Yeah. Tell me A, B, and C. Give me your account number. Okay, great. I found you. Tell me this. And then it picks out the buzzwords and will say, is this what you're looking for? So that, that kind of chat bot experience really is a demonstration of the deep learning, the machine learning and the artificial intelligence. But there are a lot of places that you look at these circles and you think, yeah, I can I can see it. And some that you might not have thought of before. That's really interesting. And I guess you can you can see its application in, in lots of our everyday lives with, thing, with things like that. You know, you don't really have to Google something and then, you know, you get, either get adverts or emails, like you say. But why do you think adoption of this technology is, is still quite slow? You know, there's a lot of reasons that we hear and we we look at surveys, we create our own surveys, constantly trying to get feedback from businesses on why they aren't using more automated solutions. And to be honest, some of them are very practical. I don't have the budget. OK, fair. You might have to or might want to invest budget in a new solution. Uh, but oftentimes it really comes down to a preference and a belief. So you've got a big portion. I want to say it's around 40 percent of respondents in one of the recent surveys that we did that cite cost issues. Hmm. Artificial intelligence doesn't have to cost a lot. There are ways for you to get the benefit of the solutions without having to put robots everywhere in your organization. But the bigger contribution to reasons for not adopting it are based on not having business buy-in or uncertainty around the reliability of the solution uh, and things of that sort. So a lot of it is really around, does your leadership buy into this concept? Do you buy into this concept? And, and going forward from there. So you've got a couple of hard challenges around maybe cost, maybe integration with legacy systems that takes a bit of effort, but a big chunk of it is really just the lack of understanding or lack of belief in what it can do. Absolutely, I'd completely agree with that. And then taking it to, um, linking it to procurement specifically, how are um, AI and, and machine learning and, and procurement connected and, and why are people adopting this technology? Where have you seen the, um, people specifically implementing it? Yeah, so there's a couple. Um, I put together two slides for, for you all just to get a sense of how we think about this. And there are a few different, I think, bigger picture reasons as to why organizations adopt um, AI and ML because they're trying to unlock benefits. And these are three that we regularly hear from our customers that we, that we talk to them about. Automating to save, save time and money. That's really at the core of it. When you look at that uh, visual I had before on the doing to the thinking, automation is that biggest circle around it all. Automation helps with the doing. It's a way to save resource, redirect resource towards more value, adding projects and initiatives. So you're saving their time and ideally you're saving money off the back of it as well. So it's a really practical focus on resource management. Automate the non-value adding, redirect that resource to do something else for your business. So that's the first big one. The second one is around just generally making more data driven decisions. So I said, I think procurement is a very data rich organization. Buying in general tends to be a very data focused uh, part of the business process, making more data driven decisions. It's how to use data to, to effectively analyze what to buy, when, from whom, how to deliver it, and then also ensure compliance against that as well. So yeah. using data to drive decisions, second biggest one in my mind. And then the third is the one that um, I think I, I, I find the most interesting. It's around visibility uh, and then control. Visibility gives you control. So a lot of times we, we talk about tailspin and the problem with tailspin and why it's something that businesses need to face into. A lot of folks will say, I don't really care about tailspin. I, I'm focused on the, the bigger chunks of my business. I've got visibility. Well, you think you do until you really start digging under the covers and understanding there's a lot of stuff happening in the business that you might not have visibility of. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing because it, it assumed good intent. People are buying things they need to do their jobs. Well, if you can harness all of that, get visibility, you can start identifying trends. And maybe something that you thought was tailspin before actually is an opportunity to negotiate a contract and buy in bulk and save your business X percentage of, of pounds spend on that. So I think 
getting visibility gives you control because you really start getting a grasp on what is happening in your organization. So those are kind of the three overarching buckets that that I tend to think about in terms of why businesses use automation or uh, AI and ML. And then if I can click to the next one and then I'll I'll stop talking for a minute. (laughs) Specifically about procurement. These are really useful tools that um, procurement can use to help them improve the way they do their jobs and improve their output as well. So thinking about using data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, getting that real-time actionable insights. This is super important for buying organizations or buying functions because you need to buy what your business needs. You don't want to buy more than what you need, and you certainly don't want to be short of what you need. So having real-time information that can help you audit the state of your business and take very quick actions, preempt problems before they occur, it's really powerful. And, And this is where I think procurement, again, has a great opportunity to use data analytics, artificial intelligence to get that real-time insight and take quick actions. Another part of that is operational efficiency. This again is just helping you manage your resource better and ensure that you're staying focused on the things that drive the greatest value for your yeah. business. So operational efficiency, save time, save money. That's what you want in procurement. Um, and then the third piece really particular to this audience is probably around supplier risk management. There is a great opportunity to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help drive your organization to buy from the suppliers that you want to and not buy from those that you don't and ensure that the suppliers you do buy from are giving you the best value. So these are a few pieces that kind of tie back to that earlier diagram with all the different spokes on how it comes to life, but a few focus areas that we tend to talk about a lot in relation to to procurement leaders. Absolutely. And I think um, in the current environment, especially, I mean, people are are looking to spread their risk much more, moving away from sole sourcing. So that's more suppliers to, yeah. to, to manage. So and anything that can automate that. And like I say, that tail end, although that may not may end up being non-strategic stuff, it's the it's the area that causes quite a lot of noise uh, for procurement teams and, and a large amount of your time will be focused on, on, on that area with, with, you know, um, on, you know, low risk items. So, yeah. And, and particularly recently with shortages of, of items and commodity prices fluctuating like they do, I think really getting some data and intelligence and that's one thing, but then learning how to, to analyze that and do something with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's really timely for procurement. That was yeah. super interesting. I, I, I've learned a lot more actually from that. So thanks, Molly. Um, now, you, um, this session is is going to be um, case study led. So I'm going to hand over to you, Molly, to um, introduce your case study. And then I'm going to come back and um, bring some questions from the audience. So make sure that everybody um, listening in, um, submit your questions into the Q&A box. I'll be looking out from them and I will join you shortly. So over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Emma. Um, with that, I, w- I am very pleased to welcome Keely and Harry onto the screen so you can see them now. Um, Keely is a procurement director at Busy Bees and Harry, a procurement manager. Um, I've got the easy job here where I get to just sit on the side and talk about buzzwords and technology. It's a very different conversation to hear it from the folks that are actually utilizing solutions that are data-driven, artificial intelligence. So that's why I'm really pleased to have both Harry and Keely join us today to talk to you a little bit about um, their experience. So with that, I will hand it over to Keely and Harry to talk to you about their case study. Thank you very much. Can we have the first slide, please? So it seems, it seems like yesterday, but also um, eons ago. So in 2019, we began our journey to streamline our UK procurement function. Um, previous to, to 2019, historically, our heads of department and nursery managers had purchased locally and, and managed their own spend, um, some with credit cards and some with accounts, which meant that for our nurseries alone, we had 300 suppliers on our on our system, which which was creating quite a lot of back office noise. Um, so our journey began to streamline our UK procurement function because we wanted to deliver a purchasing experience to centres, which was underpinned by a, a digital solution. We knew that we needed to simplify, rationalise, and create compliance. Um, but to, to deliver a prescriptive but not restrictive uh, procurement solution. 
So we wanted to deliver in the here and now, but also set ourselves up for the future um, and leverage all the benefits which technology we know can drive for, for global procurement moving forward in the digital age. So our journey began with the UK in mind, firstly, um, but we, we now know that the experience that we've created can be replicated globally as local territory, territory teams require. Next slide, please. So our mission was very clear and simple. Um, as Keely said, we have 300 product suppliers that our, our centres, nurseries purchased from. We had very, very little data. We didn't know specific products that were being purchased, et cetera. So we had to standardise and streamline our procurement processes and also not just our central office procurement processes, but the processes that our centres and nurseries go through every day to ensure that they're fit for now, but also our future growth. Um, a big part of that was investing in a system that automates our back office invoicing processes. And that took a lot of manual work away from our nursery managers. And it created a much more efficient procurement offer for the business. So we rationalised our supply base. We went from 300 product suppliers to about eight of our, is it our approved supplier base size now. Um, our centres have a digital experience with all of those. It is self-serve for all of them. It's very, very simple. We needed to make sure that the experience for them was future-proof. So it had to be digital. It had to have opportunities to improve in the future. And we had to be able to prescribe where centres bought product categories from, but we didn't want to restrict too heavily what they were buying because we wanted to make sure that we were guaranteeing compliance in our supply base and that centres were buying from where we had approved them to buy any products from. Um, at the heart of all of that we've done for the past two years is delivering exceptional service value and quality, both to us as a head office function, the data that we receive, the account management that we receive, but also to the centres as well so that they can see that, you know, this is, this is the way forward for them. Next slide, please. So why Amazon Business? Um, Amazon Business were, were never really part of, of the journey. We, the journey was set so that we would use um, our traditional suppliers. Um, Amazon Business contacted me on a number of occasions and I, and I kept not answering the phone or not, not answering those emails. And then one day in May 2019, I decided to pick up the phone and Jamie, our account uh, manager, was on the other, other end of the line. And, and actually, he was a human being, which I didn't think existed in, in Amazon, which was just amazing. Um, I think with without the amazing account management, we wouldn't be where we are today, which I know how he's going to um, talk to on the next, next slide. But Amazon provides such a competitive marketplace but with that a number of controls that enable us to manage centrally what what our centers are purchasing um, and of course the speed and cost effectiveness of, of delivery um, which is absolutely phenomenal our, our historic suppliers just just couldn't match so so of course we still have historic traditional um, childcare suppliers um, but but particularly for our, our tail end spend and, and nappies which again Harry is going to going to pick up um, the the Amazon business solution for our centers and head office um, teams is, is just phenomenal um, I think you can you can see a quote there on the slide from from one of our regional maintenance technicians um, who visit our centres on a on a periodic timetable. Um, previous to to having Amazon Business, they would our technicians would would nip off to to local suppliers and and pick up supplies which would take chunks of time out, out of the day. Now they they place the order two or three days pre visit. The the equipment is waiting for them at centre. They can get on, complete their jobs and, and move on to the next job, which, which make things much, much more efficient for, for the maintenance technicians, but also the centres as well. Next slide, please. So there's three major wins and takeaways that we achieved with our rollout of Amazon business in 2019. Uh, yeah, for us as a business, we gained 100% compliance and take up and sign up of Amazon business for our UK centres. And we're at about 360 centres at the moment within six months of implementing Amazon business. And that meant that we could remove 80 individual Amazon Prime subscriptions that centres had signed up to on their credit cards, which had to be manually coded and manually processed every month. 
and consolidate that onto one account that we pay for annually with an automated invoicing process in place as well. And since then, we've grown to implementing across our head office functions for our regional maintenance technicians, for example, as Keely set out. But we're also now supporting our Italian colleagues and they're working with Amazon Business in Italy so that we now have 650 users across Europe on Amazon Business. We successfully transitioned 100% of our nappy spend. And obviously talking about nappies is quite unique to childcare, but for us with 42,000 children in the UK, we spend a lot of money on nappies. Um, and we were able to consolidate from a brand leader to Mama Bear Amazon brand nappies, simply because, or largely because of the simplified ordering process. You can see the quote from Jess, one of our centre directors there, how much easier it is and the frequency of ordering that Amazon allows, the data that we can see when centres are ordering, what they're ordering, et cetera, is just brilliant for us. And as Keely's already alluded to, the account management that we receive from Amazon Business is brilliant. We think big, Amazon Business help us to make that happen. And that can be from a dedicated ordering list for our maintenance technicians right the way through to a specific group to enable us from head office to reward our centers of excellence for the brilliant work that they do. Next slide, please. So we, we feel that we, you know, out of our 37 years of, of operating Busy Bees, two, two years with Amazon is, is obviously our, our um, relationship is, is still in its infancy. We've, we've done so much and we, we've got so far, but, but we want to continue to, to work with Amazon. Um, they're like-minded, as Harry said, they, they think big and, and they, they listen to, to our ideas and, and press on with them. So um, we'd like to continue um, engaging with Amazon Business to support our ESG initiatives. We, we, have, we have a challenging plan, which I'm sure that every, every business has a challenging plan, but we believe that, that Amazon will support us to, to make that happen. Uh, there's no secret that our account management um, team know that, that we really want to push forward and investigate opportunities for global expansion within the account. So, so to have one account for the business globally, um, which gives, gives all of our colleagues across the globe the opportunities to, to purchase mm -hmm. the same sort of, um, of items which, were, which fit in with, it, with our global brand. Um, and then also following the success of the Mama Bear Nappy launch, we, we want to continue to expand categories with Amazon brands and, and continue that, that partnership moving forwards. And, and I think overarchingly, Amazon helps us to, to support our centres to deliver the best stars in life to our children. And um, we've given our centre directors back the gift of time so that they don't have to go out and look, look for value um, locally. That, that's us. Back to Molly. Um, I know I, I, I spent a good amount of the time so far today talking about how automation removes human intervention. So it's a little bit funny that is Jamie's persistence and continuing to call Keely. That is the one that got them to, to work with us in the end. Um, but thank you to Keely and Harry. And I think it, it's, it's a really good demonstration of how the Busy Bees team had an idea of what they were trying to deliver. And we became a part of that. And now we're, we're driving change together. And, and that's the exciting part around what we do and working with customers where it's not us pushing a solution on a customer. We really thrive on helping individual organizations achieve their, their own goals. So I think Harry and Keely are a really great demonstration of, of having that foresight and having an idea of what they want to deliver and being committed to getting the adoption that they want with a, a solution that can last them for the long term. So um, please do ask any questions that you have for the Busy Bees team in the chat, or we'll have um, a bit of Q&A time at the end. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the Amazon business tools again. So digital marketplace solutions such as Amazon business, that's what I'm highlighting today, obviously, uh, we can help integrate AI and ML across the value train, chain to translate data into insights and ideally find cost savings or help you achieve your other um, automation goals. So this really, this approach looking across the value chain is, is how you can extend the procurement intelligence beyond just a procurement function to really elevate procurement up the strategic agenda of your company. So one of the things that I, I think I appreciate most about my time at Amazon is that is seeing how all the different pieces fit together. Um, because when I talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, a lot of that power comes from Amazon Web Services. 
It's another part of Amazon. They create the, the deep learning, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence. And then you can feed that into other Amazon solutions, such as Amazon Business, or incorporating Alexa voice technology into your ordering. So it's a really nice kind of cross Amazon product offering. So some of the things I've I talk about today, we'll tie together Amazon Web Services, Amazon Business, and Alexa. But want to click through a couple of slides just introducing you to some of the features specifically that we have within Amazon Business to help procurement, finance, and buying functions. So looking at this uh, first slide that I have here up on the screen, um, we're talking about automating or removing the human intervention, automating your shopping, ordering, and delivery. So these are just a few examples that I wanted to highlight. Um, one around suggested products. I mentioned that a little bit earlier with the broader picture with the um, spokes coming off of it. Suggested products. This is where you can get recommendations of other products that you can find as substitutes, as replacements, as complementary products without having to go search for it. And, and this is just a way for you to save some time and think a little bit bigger about your purchases and how different pieces fit together and find things that are popular with other organizations that might be similar to yours. The business lists, I think, are really helpful. So creating a, a shopping list of some kind or a preferred list that can be shared across the organization that makes it very clear what you think people should buy from certain product categories. Now, this is a way to do a one-to-many exercise where you can curate the catalog into something very quickly that the, you then distill out and individuals can buy directly from your shopping list without having to go, go shop, go think, go do comparison shopping nothing. It's a personalized list that you can create that can feed across your, your business, make for very easy reordering. And then interestingly, you can also assign budgets to different shopping lists. If you say work from home, something we've talked to a lot of organizations about in the last year, still going to be relevant looking ahead as a lot of businesses have announced flexible working policies or even permanent remote working. The ability to assign a maximum a maximum spend and direct people to what they need to buy and then audit it after. It's really helpful for um, automating that shopping and uh, monitoring of ordering process. Deliveries also, that's that's the most important part of the, the chain that we talk about because you can order as many products as you want, but if they don't come when you want them to or the way that you want them to, it's not particularly helpful. So using automation to set particular delivery windows, you can set preferences to consolidate all of your deliveries if you want them delivered in a certain way. You can use locker technology. If you say, that's great, I, I love ordering things for our business, we know we need to, but my reception desk can't handle all of those parcels. You can think about a locker solution where the individual buyers get a notification when their order has been delivered. They go self-service the pickup. No intervention needed from, from another third party in there. And then the mobile app. This is something that um, is increasing in importance in a business setting in a way that it really hasn't been before. It's how people like to shop on their mobile. And there used to be kind of this divide between I shop on my mobile for my personal life and I shop on my computer in my procurement solution for my business life. No, those all combine together now. We, we will be on the move again and people are moving more than, more than ever in a normal state. Being able to get what you need when you need it with information at your fingertips, it's super powerful for helping you automate that shopping order and delivery process. So Amazon business app, great marketplace option for you. Having that mobile solution, especially if your organization is one that has a, a big field force or folks that don't spend a lot of their time um, at their desks. So looking a little bit more about the intelligence piece of that um, and the analytics. So if you wanna click to the next slide, there, there are a few features in particular that we developed for Amazon Business to do some of the things that Keely and Harry were talking about before on streamlining processes, finding those competitive offers, and then ensuring compliance and control. So the first piece around guided buying, this is kind of a simulation uh, or a replacement for an individual that needs to review and audit and approve every order before it goes through. You can set up a system to help do that for you. We call that guided buying with Amazon Business. It's how you set uh, parameters on your account to determine how people can or should and can't or won't use your account. So this is where, again, it doesn't have to be an individual making all of those decisions every single time. 
you set up a solution to create a framework that does that for you. And then your auditing is only needed when something falls outside of those bounds. So it empowers your buyers to make the, the decisions that they need as an individual, but gives you as an organizational leader control on what happens. Now, prior to my, uh, my role with Amazon Business, Actually, at the beginning of my Amazon days, I, I worked on what I call the nerdy side of fashion. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I really enjoy data and analytics and the, and the power of data and analytics to help you make decisions. Now, I'm not saying that you only rely on data and you never have to think again. Not at all the case. But it really helps you save time and give you direction and help you verify um, your beliefs and, um, I guess, put weight behind your ideas. So within the Amazon business solution, we have a, an, a suite of analytics tools. And this is where there's, there's no need to copy, paste, drop, whatever columns you want, format in Excel. We're going to take all that work away and say, every single order that comes to your Amazon business account, you have visibility to that in a real time dynamic dashboard. And you can look at all of the purchases happening within your organization. You can look at it by group and say, well, I've seen business orders spike from this nursery or from this school or from this plant. You can double click into that and see exactly what was purchased and by whom and when and know if you have questions that you need to ask. So we don't want you to have to hunt for those insights. What we want is for those insights to be presented to you. And then your job is to take action on those insights. So the analytics tool that we have in Amazon Business, it's powered by Amazon QuickSight, which comes from our AWS team. And it really helps you start analyzing those patterns and seeing those patterns in a way that you might not have been able to before. And then the last piece I talked a little bit earlier around supplier compliance. As Emma said, there's been a lot of supply chain disruption in the last year and a half, and who knows if and when it'll happen again. So having a dynamic approach for managing your supplier base and feeling confident with the suppliers that you buy from, there are tools within Amazon Business that can help you do that, shopping from hundreds and thousands of different suppliers and getting that competitive offer with a delivery promise you want without you having to go hunt for those orders, do any of those comparison, vet those suppliers because we've done that for you. So the intent of some of these tools is really to give you visibility, compliance and control all in one place. Last piece then, just kind of bringing that all together. Um, yes, I. Clearly, I'm biased towards Amazon business because it's the piece of the business that I work on. But there's great power in digital transformation initiatives and B2B marketplaces such as Amazon business. These are resources for you to bring AI and ML into your organization. So if you click to the last slide, this was just a little bit of a summary on some of the things we talked about today. The, the key focus oftentimes with automation or the removal of human intervention is really to save time and money. It's to find you efficiencies so you can redirect that resource to do something else for your business. The, the brain power behind the AI and ML, it really helps you define data-driven strategies for how you make decisions on selecting suppliers, deciding what to buy from those suppliers, and ensuring compliance with the decisions that you make. I get very excited, like I said, around the analytics because I think having true visibility into what is happening in, in your organization, that is what unlocks your ability to get control over that spend and find opportunity. And then the last piece is how you think a little bit bigger. Kiwi mentioned um, Busy Bees Thinking Big. They have a business that they run today, but it doesn't mean they always have to do things the same way they've done before. We want to, we want to look ahead and think about how we can integrate intelligence across the value chain, up and down, and further bring buying up your strategic agenda and think a little bit differently about how buying fits within your organizational goals. So that's kind of the overview that I wanted to share um, on Amazon Business specifically and some of the tools that, that we put in place to, to help your organization. Great. Thanks, Molly. That was really interesting. And thanks, Harry and Kaylee. If, if they want to come back on screen as well, we could take some questions. We have had, had one question through. Um, and I guess um, we've been talking a lot here about buying products, which I guess fits with with um, the solution that we're talking about here. But um, what about non-standard requirements or services or non-repetitive um, goods? And um, where, where does the, uh, uh, the AI and technology fit in there? Uh, Keely and Harry can probably comment from a busy bee perspective for from my side. We don't talk a lot about services within Amazon business, but never say never. Um, so 
you will see in a lot of marketplace solutions, Amazon business included, that there are product associated services, which are things like installation or um, basic maintenance and repair, or you buy a camera and you get uh, photography lessons with it. So that sort of marketplace model still works the same for services as it does for products and being able to quickly make those comparisons, set parameters for what you want and don't want and be able to make a selection that way. So it's not something that we spend a lot of time on today simply because we still have a heck of a lot of work to do on the product side of it, but the logic is still the same in terms of how you can find efficiencies, I think in my mind at least. Hey, what about what about you at Busy Bees in terms of non-products? Yeah, I think we're probably in a, in a similar place, Molly, with where we are, having spent a lot of time focusing on our product procurement that was in such a disparate place and no data, no visibility behind it. To have got that to the position that we're in now is brilliant. But yeah, we, we are very much on the journey of, of putting in the similar logic, the similar processes for our services. But I, I would agree that, that, you know, there is the potential there. There's no reason why it also wouldn't work for the same for, for the different areas. Excellent. And, and Busy Bees, one through for you um, from the audience as well about, um, you know, you've obviously got a global operation and you're rolling this out globally. Um, have you had any um, have you had any problems with um, countries where Amazon business is not yet available? Is, has that been an issue? Um, it hasn't been a massive issue right now because because our journey began with um, the UK and then and then Europe, so that's where we're focused. But moving forward, um, we're we're expecting that Amazon will move in, in at the same pace as, as we will. Yeah. So, for example, the our biggest overseas territories are Singapore, um, Australia, the US, and Canada. Obviously, it's going to be fairly, you know, it's a fairly reasonable expectation that Amazon business will be operating there, but we're also in Vietnam. So, you know, that may have to come at a later date. Yeah, so kind of a phased rollout there as things come on board. And um, I guess a couple of questions from me, really, um, for Harry and Keeley. Uh, what was, um, how did you pull your business case together to get buy in for this, really? Was it quite an easy sell or? And did you have to do some convincing? I think I think it, it was it was quite the easy sell. I think you know when when you look at the data, Harry mentioned that we had 80, 80 Amazon accounts, eighty or ninety Amazon accounts, and, and within those accounts, within the centres, we'd spent around ninety thousand pounds in in twenty eighteen. So there was an argument there that actually, even though we, we were telling our centers they, they shouldn't be using Amazon, they were using Amazon. And because we wanted compliance from our centers with, with a whole raft of, of new policies that we're putting in to create compliance, we knew that actually if, if we gave them Amazon for their tail spend, then, then we were very much hoping that they would, they would comply. So literally it was, it was a conversation and a, and a pitch to our, our CEO who, who actually said, can't we buy anything off Amazon? And we said, well, no, not today. <laughs> the expectation is that, that that one day our our centres will have that Amazon style, you know, experience for for all of their shopping. And what other areas are you looking to expand this in? Are you looking to increase other category areas as part of this? Yeah, I think we we mentioned on on the slides about about the brands. Amazon nappies have have really been a, a massive success for us because they're consumable because they because we order them on a very very regular basis. The 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 delivery function fits very well for us. So you know we we always speak to Amazon about all of the different things that that they could they could deliver for us and every tender we we complete Amazon are always invited so we we have some products in mind um, but but in terms of of the 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 big development we we believe that they'll definitely be with with Amazon brand. Great. And um, Molly, uh, can you give us a feel for the types of category spends that are currently available in Amazon business and, and um, where, where you're looking to expand these? Yeah, I think the, I would say the most common product categories that we talk about with customers are office supplies and IT peripherals. And especially in the last year and a half, again, with that remote working for a lot of folks, um, that's just the products that they need. But that's sort of just 
scratching the surface because I don't think we talked as much about nappies as we have in the last year and a half with busy bees <laughs> and the discussions there. And you think about some of the other customers we work with. We a lot of people don't know that we launch categories such as business, industrial, and scientific supplies. So laboratory equipment and supplies, um, professional medical, dental, uh, janitorial and sanitation. These are things that people don't typically associate with Amazon, but these are products that we sell. And I would say one, one important thing to think about is a lot of folks look at Amazon as we're one, one giant entity. We're really not. A Amazon business is a conduit for hundreds and thousands of different suppliers across the country to reach customers. And we talk a lot um, about supporting local businesses because, again, people look at Amazon and say, but you're this huge beast. I want to shop local. You couldn't do that a lot during the pandemic because we were physically restricted in terms of where we could move. So Amazon business, it's a marketplace solution because you have different sellers that specialize in different products that can reach a customer base that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. So we've got a lot of our small sellers that specialize in certain product categories and product types. Um, but I, I would say more broadly, office supplies and IT are the most common. And then you get into typically maintenance repair type uh, type products as well. Uh, but yeah, big orders for nappies and then dog poo ba bags, actually. That's been a big one in the last year. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> is it just because you've bought your dog? Is it? You're more aware of it. That's what it is. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because a couple of our customers that we work with that have um, security dog uh, dogs on site, that they need to buy that for their business. And once you noticed it, we noticed it everywhere. So that was a really interesting one for us this year. <laughs> Excellent. We've had a question through from Anish. It's probably for you, Molly, about um, any prerequisites um, for incorporating AI into procurement other than the availability of clean data. Does Amazon require a business process to be in a certain format or everything to, to link in with your, with your services? No, so there's a couple of different pieces to that. So within the... AI and the ML that we have with an Amazon business, there's no requirements on, on the business side in order for someone to be able to utilize those solutions. If you go into a bit of a deeper space on wanting to integrate with a single sign-on provider or want to integrate with existing solutions you already have, then there needs to be more of a tech discussion on, on managing that. But the, the analytics tools, how you use the automation, the referred products, things of that sort, nothing that you need to do to be able to adopt those solutions right away. Excellent. Um, I've had another question through, um, does artificial intelligence help in calculating real-time shipments? So I guess you're, you're not only getting that visibility on spend, but when you can expect to receive your goods too, yeah. And I think that, that we probably know from our consumer lives as well, especially if you're a prime customer, when you log on and you look at an item that says, if you order it within the next one hour and 27 <laughs> minutes, you'll have it by this time tomorrow. And all of that really is just how we're tracking the movements of products. And that's not an individual doing it. It's the, it's the machines tracking it. Excellent. And the suppliers that come on board for your marketplace, how receptive have they been to adopting this technology and providing the services? Yeah, I think a lot of the suppliers we work with and the customers, like what Keely said, is that they have they have an idea of what they want to accomplish as a business. And if we can work with them on developing our existing or finding new solutions to do it, that's where that's where the fun really is. Um, but I will say it very much depends on the organization, how open they are to adopting artificial intelligence or automated solutions. It It's not specific to certain industries or geographies. It really depends on the organization, what sort of buy-in they have for it. Excellent. Uh, well, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harry and Keeley, for joining us. That was really insightful and best of luck with your uh, continued success on um, using uh, Amazon Business. And Molly, thank you for cutting through some of that jargon and helping us to understand it much better. That was really great. Thank you both for joining us. So um, um, I hope you enjoyed that session. Uh, we recorded today's session so if you wanted to share that within your own organization uh, we'll be sending you the link to the to the recording uh, later this week or next week um, and also Amazon have a second seminar with us which is on we'll find the date here the 8th of September so make sure you sign up for that one too and that one will also be recorded as well so if you if you don't manage to catch it real time then uh, you can watch back on demand so thank you very much indeed oh I can just see details have gone into the chat on that one 
on how to register for the, for the next one. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks for all the questions coming through. Really great session there, really insightful, hopefully cutting through some, some jargon and understanding that technology a bit more and how you can apply it in your own organisation. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.